By faith. By faith. By faith. By faith. By faith is the motif that weaves through Hebrews 11, that faith chapter. The word faithful is found once. The word faith features 26 times, and of those, 22 times in that by faith motif. By faith, our ancestors have been used in mighty ways by the almighty God, and in doing so were approved by God. Why? Because they had faith. It pleases God. We can't please God without it. By faith, these ancestors were assured in the spirit of a future hope to come, a guarantee that God's promises would come through. Whether or not they were the ones to see them come in the present didn't matter. They would come and considered done by faith. God's word is as good as having been done, even when it's far away. By faith, these ancestors of ours, spiritually speaking, were absolutely convinced of the fact that the invisible God is always at work, even through sometimes unseen circumstances, working them all together to bring about his good, pleasing and perfect will. By faith, our gracious God takes little mustard seeds of faith from his people and plants and grows into majestic trees in his kingdom for generations to nest in, be protected by and nourished from. In faith, God is taking flawed people and carrying them through their weaknesses in the power of his covenant-keeping, loyal love every day to do great things in his name. And in these last days in which we're in since Christ, even greater things in the name of Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Our faith. What a gift that is. It's a gift from God when he opens up our eyes and we see Christ for who he truly is, the hope and saviour of the world, our only way, the truth and the life, the only one through whom anyone can get to God and have a future. We believe he exists. We believe he rewards those who seek him and he empowers us by his grace as a gift of faith to proceed on that foundation. Who are we if we are not people of faith? We are no one. We are no thing if we don't have faith in Jesus. How so? Ephesians 2. We are saved by grace through faith. That's our only hope. And this is not from ourselves. We're nothing or no one without it. It is God's gift. Not from works so that none of us can boast. And the reason we are no one or no thing without faith in Jesus is because without that, we have faith in fleeting treasures and failing foundations in life. Because the truth is, we have faith. You can't live without faith. Faith in nothing is faith because it disqualifies every claim of God through his word or any other movement or philosophy. To believe none of them is to put your faith in that position. We will fall holding fake treasure if our supreme treasure is not Christ. 
You see, whether it is power or possessions, science, self or anything else, if those things aren't truly able to secure us and they're not, ultimately, we're insecure. Ultimately. No matter how much faith we place in anything. But our God, the creator of heaven and earth, can secure us eternally. By his grace, we have the assurance through faith in Jesus. You heard that correctly. Faith and assurance are not opposites. They go together. Our faith is our assurance of what is hoped for. Because we have a conviction of what is not seen. The invisible God working always in the sometimes unseen, sometimes seen circumstances. Last week we pulled Sarah, Abraham's wife, out of the Hall of Faith trophy cabinet, if you will, and examined her faith journey. A journey we noticed was flawed. That's the name of the series, Flawed. She had a hard time trusting God was at work, didn't she? Or at least that she didn't need to help him work. But in the end, God was gracious, wasn't he? Loving and merciful. Faithful to his promise, of course. And what a testimony Sarah brings to the world. She made a mess of her life with impatience and DIY blessings. God cleaned that mess. God made something great and beautiful. He brought about a nation from her barren womb. And in his mercy placed her in the hall of faith. Another mustard seed germinated and grown into something majestic in the kingdom of God. Where can God carry us if we will just have a mustard seed faith? This week we reach back into that cabinet and we pull out of the hall of faith a hero, if you will, certainly a, a Jewish hero, a hero of Israel, a bright beacon of history, of what it means to be a faithful and courageous leader. His name is Moses. His credentials are set out in Hebrews chapter 11. We read in verse 23, By faith, Moses, after he was born, was hidden by his parents for three months because they saw that the child was beautiful and they didn't fear the king's edict. Moses is from good stock, apparently. Faithful stock. At least brave stock. Mum and dad ignored Pharaoh. They saw something in their boy. I think every parent, most parents would or should see something special in their children. But we have here a feeling that there was a special discernment or a special faith from these parents. Perhaps a conviction that God would use this child to do something extraordinary. Something worth risking their lives to protect. And so they did. Those of us with children, do we have a conviction that God is marking out our kids to do something extraordinary? I hope so. The world needs them. What are we willing to do or risk or lose in order to protect that calling of God on our children's lives? The way we bring them up will either amplify that calling or drown the calling. Moses' parents did not fear the king's edict, it says. The edict is an official order from Pharaoh that every Hebrew baby be killed at birth. Every Israelite baby be thrown into the Nile River to stop the Jews from multiplying in the land. Hebrew, Israelite, Jew, all the same thing. God's people descendants of Abraham, through Isaac. 
Now, God help anyone who doesn't follow this edict. And that's exactly what happened. God did help anyone who didn't follow the edict. The Hebrew midwives were pretending, oh, I didn't get there in time. These women are so fast. I just couldn't have an opportunity to throw the baby in the Nile. God protected them. It says he gave them families. As for Moses' parents, they hid him for three months at the risk of their lives. And then mum placed him in a waterproof basket that she had manufactured. Not thrown into the Nile, but placed gently, lovingly and committed to God. Moses was then found by none other than Pharaoh's own daughter, who then needed someone to nurse the baby and paid mum to nurse her own child. Talk about a reward of faith. The invisible God was at work through unseen and seen circumstances. Are we convinced he's at work even though we don't see? Do we believe? Even in the most dire and threatening circumstances that he's not asleep or apathetic? Verse 24, By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter and chose to suffer with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasure of sin. For he considered reproach for the sake of Christ to be greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt since he was looking ahead to that reward. Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter And the author here of Hebrews is clear to point out his age. This happened when he had grown up. When he was mature. Why is that important? Because the author doesn't want us to conclude that Moses was some young punk that made a stupid decision. Moses wasn't some delinquent treating a serious matter lightly or out of disrespect or ignorance. Moses had grown up. This was a man making a mature decision. He refused his royal title by faith, not foolishness. He had no regret. Moses was in the palace of a nation that served his adopted daddy, Pharaoh, as an actual god. And yet he knew he was from a different people, Hebrew people. They served the one true God, the God of his ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When he visited them, when he tried to relieve their suffering, when he tried to avenge their wrong, his life made a statement. I prefer to return to my own people, God's people, than remain in the king's court. That's what he was saying with his life. That faith is a gift from God. It is so countercultural. It is so spiritual. It is not of the flesh. And anyone who has chosen God, the invisible God, and the future kingdom has been given that gift. Pray that we have that gift. And if we have it, hold on to it with life. It would have been much better for Moses to remain in Egypt, wouldn't it? Of course it would have, without an eternal perspective. But Moses was persuaded of something divinely, I believe, of course. God had promised to bless the race of Abraham. Moses had a share in that blessing. Remember, he was a Hebrew baby. He was meant to be thrown in. Moses was from that race. God had promised to bless. But on the other hand, He held the riches of Egypt. 
He was from that house. He'd grown up in that house. Moses chose well. He chose the promise over the palace. That was a good choice, a divine choice. Because think about this, the palace was right there. It wasn't a, a, a kind of speculator. He held the keys to the palace. It was his to let go of. But the promise of God to bless his people, Abraham's descendants, There was absolutely no evidence of that blessing other than the promise. Where was Moses going to go to see that promise? To the Hebrew prison? To the Hebrew slave camps? To the babies floating face down in the Nile? God's promise was the only evidence Moses had. And he let go of the palace in his hand to take hold of the promise he couldn't see. That's faith. What do we need to let go of in our life in order to take hold of the promise of God in our life? Moses was assured of what he hoped for. Moses had a conviction of what was not seen by faith. What further evidence do we need when we have Christ crucified? Have we not seen? I want to single you out again this morning. As I ask myself when I look in the mirror, do you have faith? No one else in the room, just you. That's what counts if you have faith. And if you don't, you come and you search and you dig and you knock and you seek and you will find God ready to give you a gift of eternal life. Speak to me about that later. 2 Corinthians says, For every one of God's promises is yes in Jesus. We have every answer we need to God's promises. Verse 27 of Hebrews 11 says, By faith he left Egypt behind, not being afraid of the king's anger. For Moses persevered as one who sees him who is invisible. It's as though he could see him. Moses left Egypt twice, really. He fled the first time after he killed the Egyptian slave master. He fled in fear of Pharaoh's wrath. But the second time, he turned his back on Egypt and all that it presented and represented. That leaving was not out of fear of Pharaoh or anyone else. That's the one that's in view here in the Hall of Faith. And Moses' faith caused him to respond to God as though God were visibly standing in front of him. Indeed, we read in Exodus 33 something absolutely remarkable that the Lord would speak with Moses face to face. Just as a man speaks with his friend, then Moses would return to the camp. What intimacy with God Moses had. If only we could have that kind of relationship, that kind of intimacy with God. We can. God would meet Moses inside this tent and the Spirit, God's Spirit would come and reside on this tent in the form of a cloud. But in these last days, since Christ... His spirit resides in his people. That's intimate. 
James 4, 8 says, Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. We are not of those who draw back, but those who have faith. And we draw near to God by faith. Verse 20, John 14, 23, Jesus answered, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. That's precious. That's intimate. It's better than a cloud in a tent. Are we drawing near to God? And let's not be ignorant on how to do that. Jesus tells us how to do that there. By keeping his word. No, that's not salvation by works. We keep his word by faith. And he resides in us in the most precious and intimate and empowering relationship through faith. Moses persevered as one who sees him who is invisible. And so can we. Verse 28, by faith, he instituted the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch the Israelites. By faith, they crossed the Red Sea as though they were on dry land. When the Egyptians attempted to do this, they were drowned. Make no mistake, this measure of faith to lead multitudes through these two all or nothing, do or die instances is nothing less than awe-inspiring. We see the Passover lamb as the type of Christ now. We look at our New Testament revelation. We see what happened in Egypt and we see the foreshadowing and we see the symbolism and all that Christ did on the cross makes sense when we look at the Passover night. Not for Moses. Moses believed God as though he just, he, he just had faith. And as he sprinkled blood on the doorposts of those houses, he saw no effect of that promise. He was just faithfully carrying out and doing what God had told him. It was anticipated by faith that God would keep his end of the deal. And he did. And he does. And he will. When it came to crossing the Red Sea, this was not an exciting opportunity for a cool trick. These were not water people to say the least. Moses wasn't the surf club chaplain. These people freaked out. The sea represented everything that was chaotic and evil and dangerous. Scared out of their wits. Stuck. Hemmed in. Like some of us today. They were drawing back, actually. The people. Moses says in Exodus 14, Don't be afraid. Stand firm and see the Lord's salvation that he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. And you must be quiet. Have faith. Your enemies, when God says it's time, you'll never see again. It doesn't matter what they are. I think Moses here is instituting a really good family rule. If you don't have anything faithful to say, don't say anything at all. What if our houses were like that? That's a rule I'm going to institute. They'll find out. I don't think they're here. What a rule. If you don't have anything faithful to say, don't say anything at all. That just discredits the God who is faithful and gave us no cause to doubt. The rest is history. With that, Moses lifted up his staff, parted the sea, led them through. The enemies were wiped. 
Then he proceeds to lead God's people through the wilderness. This amazing, epic journey of 40 years on an incredible path of faith that includes shoes that never wear out, water from rocks, meetings with God, instituting law, manna from heaven, victory in battles, and on and on. As God leads them in pillars of cloud and pillars of fire, no wonder this guy's a hall of faither, right? Impeccable, flawless. No, like us. Flawed, actually. Chosen for great things by the power of God's Spirit, but weak in His flesh, like us. Flawed. Out of control anger can keep us from glorifying God. Anger is a powerful emotion. And yes, there is such thing as a righteous anger, but we're never at that point when we're losing our temper. We know when we're not at that point, actually. Because the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. I want to show you what this might look like.
In Numbers 20, God says, Take the staff and assemble the community. You and your brother Aaron are to speak to the rock while they watch, and it will yield its water. Moses and Aaron summoned the assembly in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels! Must we bring water out of this rock for you? Then Moses raised his hand and struck the rock twice. So that abundant water gushed out and the community and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust me to demonstrate my holiness in the sight of the Israelites, You will not bring this assembly into the land I have given them, into the promised land, the one you've been waiting for 40 years to get to. Moses was fed up, possibly burnt out. He was ground down by the grumbling of people and the rigors of his mission. But he lost perspective with an outburst of uncontrollable anger. Not only did he lose perspective, he lost his opportunity to enter into everything God had prepared. Anger can do that. This is not an easy passage to understand, actually with our carnal minds, because we kind of look at that anger and think it's justified. We think, yeah, that's reasonable in light of this, this and that. Yeah, we, we identify. That's the point. <laughs> We're flawed too. But his anger distorted his view and dishonored God, ultimately causing great loss. Firstly, God never told him to speak to the people, did he? He told him to speak to the rock. Moses blasted the people. He felt offended. Listen, you rebels! Forgetting he too is a rebel. Secondly, he credits himself with the miracle. Rather than humbly leading the way for God to do his thing and be glorified. He says, must Aaron and I bring water from the rock for you? Whose glory is this? Thirdly, rather than speak to the rock, he strikes it twice in anger. Possibly faithlessness. Water does flow by God's grace because God can use anyone for anything. His will will not be thwarted because of our flaws. But Moses had not honored God in his heart, 
in his anger. He had not glorified God in the presence of his people. And that's our lesson. And that's our struggle. Anger. It can cause us to miss out on so much of God's promise in this life. Because we dishonor God when we do. We all struggle with different flaws. And through this series, some will identify with more, uh, uh, you know, certain flaws than others. I identify with this flaw more than last week, for instance. The impatience. There's moments where I'm every one of these flaws. (laughs) But this one, I resonate with. Even a hall of faith like Moses can make it in the grace of God, and so can we. Isn't that encouraging? God knows our weaknesses and he's willing to forgive if we have faith. All of our flaws have been nailed to the cross with Christ. That's our faith. If we're willing to humbly come and submit to him through repentance and faith. Let's do it today. And Neil, you're going to now lead us in memory of that. So thank you.